This is the last episode of the Summer to Fall fundraiser. If you enjoy the Permaculture Podcast, make a donation now to support this show for the year ahead. You can do so online at paypal.me slash permaculturepodcast or by mail to my new address, Scott Mann, 210 East Fairfax Street, number 300, Falls Church, Virginia, 22046. As a thank you to anyone who donates $50 or more, I'll send you a USB drive with every episode from the first 10 years of the show. From my first tentative steps right after completing my permaculture design course in 2010, through to this episode, my 10th anniversary conversation with Tasha Kluna, the Perma Pixie. This is also a great way to get every episode of the show and explore just how much permaculture has to offer, as in the months ahead, I'm going to be removing the first few years of the podcast from the website. For most of you who download your episodes through iTunes, Stitcher, or Podcast Addict, you probably haven't seen these in your feed for a long time, but they have been available for direct download at thepermaculturepodcast.com. So if you'd like your own archive of these first 10 years, donate today. You can also become an ongoing member of our Patreon community at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. Today's episode marks 10 years of the Permaculture Podcast with Scott Mann, the longest-running English-language podcast dedicated to the breadth and depth of permaculture. To celebrate a decade of the show, the following interview is a personal one for me. In 2015, I interviewed Tasha Kluna, the Perma Pixie, and the two conversations we released were ones that transformed my personal perspective of permaculture. As Dave Jackie, Larry Santoyo, and Mark Lakeman moved my thoughts from permaculture as a land-based practice to a larger holistic system applicable to most human needs for design, Taj's thoughts on a fourth ethic of transition gave me an understanding of the precarious place we find ourselves in as we create the designs that lead to a more bountiful world for all life on Earth. Given all the issues we face from landscape degradation to economic programs that require our participation in systems we don't agree with, to politics and policies we have little individual control over, there's room to be gentle with ourselves and others as we find a way to navigate our path through these dynamically changing times. And so for the 10th anniversary of the Permaculture Podcast, thank you Taj for joining me to share how your life has changed since we last spoke nearly five years ago, and what thoughts and advice you might have for those of us who are well-rooted in permaculture, or for folks who are just coming to these ideas. Wow. Thank, well, thank you so much. Um, that really means a lot to me. And it's, it's great to be back and be back uh, to be part of the show. And I'm glad that, you know, some of the things that I speak of uh, stuck with you. And I hope they stuck with some other people as well. So a lot of ha- has happened in the last uh, five years. And if I was going to give advice to people, my bi- advice has probably changed a little bit um, as I change as well. I think that transition is incredibly important. It's because a lot of people actually put a lot of pressure on themselves. And one of the things that I've really noticed um, in the permaculture movement is that people tend to put people on a pedestal and people on a pedestal that actually do. They do so much. Oh, look at this person. They do so much. Oh, I I love how they've got this happening and that happening. Oh, Oh, they just do so much. And I think that's a bit of a throwback from patriarchy and it seems that a lot of people are taking this kind of like um, Western capitalist model and applying it to permaculture. And then what's happening is people are becoming really burnt out. And I can speak from personal experience as well, because we're looking up to people that do so much rather than honoring our own pace and where we're at as well. So I think that's in line with transition but it's a bit of advice about also focusing on your community instead of just kind of trying to be this one person that really kind of pushes through and tries to do everything because I don't really believe that it's, I don't believe in the word self-sufficiency anymore. I believe that it's always community sufficiency. And I think that we always utilize other people and other people's hands And now we're taking this kind of model of a village and trying to apply it to one household. And I think it's really tiring people out. So I think that the advice that I would give to people at the moment 
is to honour your own pace and try and establish community connections and don't be afraid to ask for help. And that idea of doing so much, I think about how our interactions with other people have changed as a result of things like social media, that if you follow particular permaculture practitioners or homesteaders or others, that their pictures show up on our feed and we see this like perfectly crafted moment that is consumable for social media, but isn't necessarily a reflection of what it is they go through day to day or all the work that it's taken for them to get there that we don't see the five or 10 years of building up the landscape so that they have a beautiful garden, or knowing all the people behind the scenes who are working with them. I mean, especially these days as things build up, that people may have a team of folks who are on the farm or homestead helping them take care of things so that everything looks neat and clean, and that it removes kind of the everyday element of what it is to live and practice within these systems. I think it removes the humanness of it as well, because I think that in our society and with, you know, social media, and it's really shown basically that, that kind of capitalism has taken hold of permaculture in a lot of ways in that it's, it's being marketed and it's being marketed to a mainstream, you know, for people to get involved. And that means that it's taking kind of some of the human elements out of it because people just want to see, oh, this person is so professional, this person like, they do so much. They provide so much. Look at their homesteading, beautiful life. Oh, I could be happy like them too. If only I did X, Y, and Z, you know, and I think that that's a little bit of a fallacy sometimes. And uh, the human experience is really denied. And I think that everyone is part of that human experience, whether they choose to show it or not. One of the things that I find and have found really difficult, I've been doing, running my business now for nearly a decade. And one of the things that I've thought about constantly is how to have a permaculture business in a capitalist framework when I actually feel quite anti-capitalist and I feel that, that a lot of permaculture values and ethics are also. And so running a permaculture business within that sometimes seems like a paradox to me. And then I ask myself, okay, wait, do I, do I deny myself of doing the thing that I really am passionate about because of that? But then I would just have to go get a job that was part of the same system anyway. Or do I try and find ways, you know, within this framework, you know, ways where I can have a livelihood, but I can also try and practice these ethics as much as possible. And I don't necessarily have all of the answers, but it is something that I constantly try and keep in mind and, and challenge myself about and ask the questions, you know, am I, am I pandering to a mainstream and the ideology here? Or am I looking at the broader picture? Because at the end of the day, what I care about is this functioning biosphere and all of its inhabitants and future generations. And so constantly try and keep that in mind when I'm making decisions regarding my business. I think that's really important. And so are you finding a way to balance that need for a livelihood within the dominant capitalist system? while still staying true to your passions and values? I, I am. It's a, it, it feels sometimes like I'm ice skating a little bit. I'm going one way and then I'm going the other and constantly re-evaluating things. But yeah, I, I think that I am. I'm starting to sink into it a little bit more. And one of the things that I think that I've found throughout my work is because of coming from a working class family, and practicing permaculture is feeling guilty when I do make money and battling with those feelings of going like, you know, if I'm, if I start to become more comfortable and, and I'm, I'm not comfortable, like I, I, a lot of people in uh, the Western world are, but still, I'll still battle with these feelings of kind of like guilt because I feel like I could be providing more for my community or I could be like, sharing kind of that surplus and things like that. So that's something that I've really had to learn about is, um, yeah, my own comfort in this world and what that actually looks like and what I'm willing to, yeah, what, what, what I like for my own comfort and what I'm willing to sacrifice as well. And so I do try and keep those things in mind. And I finally feel like I'm finding a little bit of balance because I have quite a lot of 
followers and supporters and if any of you are listening right now thank you so much because it has meant a lot to me on a personal level and a business level and I'm at the point in my life where I do finally feel a little bit comfortable so I don't have to constantly respond to immediacy and that's something that I really wanted to navigate through because now I can I don't want to have to put on a workshop because I feel like I want to, I want to feed myself. <laughs> I want to put on a workshop because I feel like it's something that I really have to offer. And I feel like I'm sinking into that a whole lot more in this stage of my life, which feels amazing. It's one of those things for me over the years is that I've largely existed within the gift economy. It's been through, you know, fundraisers and individual donations. It's through Patreon support you know, folks reaching out and giving different gifts, you know, materially or through letters of support or sometimes, you know, just seeds in the mail. And it's one of the things that I've struggled with is there are some times where it would be nice to have a bit more comfort, but I'm kind of torn between sitting here in the host seat and running the show because producing the podcast and connecting people to all the resources that I've established over the years and developed and kind of curated, it is a full-time endeavor. And I could go off and get a day job, which would help with some of that material comfort, but it wouldn't really make me feel any better because I would be giving up what it is that I so passionately love to do. And I really couldn't enjoy those comforts if it meant giving up this work. Yeah. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think that like, I was even saying this to someone the other day that I think I decided from a really young age that like the, what I value most is my time on this earth and how I'm in service um, on it as well. And so for me to, to work doing something that I don't believe in or to do something that I really dislike or I'm not, not fully in, I feel like I'd be wasting my like precious time on this incredible planet that has biological life and is the right distance from the sun and has all these like, you know, beautiful kind of details to make life possible. And I really want to utilize that to the best of my ability in how I'm in service and how I choose to live. And that's the most important thing to me. And a lot of what you said there resonates with me because I grew up watching my father in particular work a very, very grueling schedule. And he was working around the clock, changing shifts every seven to 10 days across five different shifts. And there was a lot of overtime during my childhood. And I respect what he did for our family, but his experiences of selling his time and being gone for so much of my childhood weren't what I wanted to live through. But I still find that it's tough to strike the balance between time and income because of the cost to live based on where we are and what we need to pay in rent or to buy a house. And it was part of where my permaculture experience took me over the years as a practice was realizing that many people don't have the resources, myself included, to go back to the land or comfortably move out of a city. And I love the education that permaculture gives us in the landscape, but there are so many places it can take us as we look at design in a a bigger lens and in different ways because our personal position can initially limit our ability to engage in many of the things that permaculture first offers us when we encounter these ideas in the landscape or first complete a traditional 72-hour PDC. Very much so. And that that, that really reminds me of, um, you know, a lot, a lot has happened in the uh, five years that we have spoken. And a lot of people don't have access to certain things that would allow them to practice permaculture in the way that they would like to. You know, we, it's, it's funny, I always ask myself this question, like how do we practice permanent culture in a temporary society? Because everything is so temporary. We don't even know what's happening on Tuesday. Like everything's so temporary and like, you know, and, and, and Indigenous peoples would always look to future generations before they made decisions. And it's very, very hard for us to do that. It's so hard that people often don't even know how to plant a fruit tree. And um, there's no judgment there, but it's also it's because people don't see trees grow. People don't watch trees grow anymore. So they have no idea how big that they get. And one of the things that, you know, I've really seen throughout the years is the 
people in, in my generation are not having access to land to practice permaculture on. And that's been a really a real struggle for a lot of people. And, you know, they're, they're renting and things like that. And, but then it's exhausting because then I watch so many people uh, that I love carting around their, um, their garden beds and their soil and everything. And it, and it becomes really exhausting for them. They get really burnt out. And I, um, I had an opportunity to live on a farm for three years since we've spoken. And it was a very huge learning curve for me because it was a, basically a agreement where like, I paid a small amount of rent there and would help to kind of manage the property. And in, in the doing that, I realized that I'm not a manager. A manager and a facilitator are very, very different things. And I am very diplomatic. And so that's where my strength lies. And so sometimes that means that I'm not the best manager. But the other things that I learned about basically trying to come to an agreement on land with people that own, that have the ownership of it when you don't is really how important formal agreements are because so many people can get together and have a informal chat about things and to go forward, but they're really not meeting on the same kinds of levels and then things can go awry. And the thing that I've seen in my situation and also in lots of people's situations that I've seen uh, actually worldwide is that a younger generation actually can be quite taken advantage of on land because people still have that ownership. They still have that bureaucratic ownership over the land. And at the end of the day, they say what goes. And the people that have been working on that land for however long don't have any say over it. So if I also could give people advice at this kind of stage in my life, and I learned this from a lot of social permaculture, but it's really how important those formal agreements are. And I think people get a little bit scared of them and having those conversations, but they're integral to not only your safety, but the the progression of the landscape itself and the regeneration of the landscape because without those agreements, you're not going to be able to find cohesion, symbiosis, and then you're not going to be able to actually, you know, provide the land with what you feel it needs. So that was a big learning curve for me. It's something that I'm working with a group with that are looking to form an intentional community. And one of the big parts of what I've shared with them so far is the need to sit down and decide what your formal rules are going to be in entering into an agreement together. You know, what are the ways that you'll make decisions together, whether that's consensus or, you know, some form of direct democracy, as well as things like how they might leave the community if someone would like to move on later and what that looks like. And just the need to put all of this down in one place where everyone can agree to it while still being flexible enough to change those rules, but so that everyone can continue to grow and adapt how they're operating over time. But more than anything, making sure they have all that in place before they do decide to make some kind of a purchase or live together. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that by actually going through that process, that formal process with people, you get to know people in a completely different way and you'll actually see if the cohesion can be there. If you know how to manage conflict in those situations, if you know how to speak to people and communicate to people on that level, rather than just a uh, friendly kind of uh, level. And I think that that's really important. And then from that time on the farm, are you still living there in that kind of a situation or have you moved on? I've moved on from there. So it's um, <laughs> actually, it's a really interesting uh, time of my life because I actually decided to move to Melbourne City, the northern suburbs of Melbourne. And I've been living in the hills for about 10 years. So I've been living in the forests. And I decided finally to um, practice, you know, more urban permaculture, be in more of an urban setting. I wanted to reach more people as well. I was quite isolated out on the farm. And then as soon as I got to 
Melbourne, probably uh, three weeks later, the um, coronavirus hit and Melbourne lockdown started. So it, and, and now I've been in an urban environment during lockdown in, instead of a, a forest environment or a farm environment, which is a completely different experience for me. And I, I'm sure that there are, there are big uh, lessons in that. But at the moment, I'm just not necessarily sure what they are. And what's it like navigating this move from the farm and forest to the city during lockdown? How has it changed you and your practices for the time being? Wow. Well, if I'm completely honest, uh, talking about that, you know, those human aspects that people don't choose to show on social media that much, I've been having a really difficult time with it. And I think that one of the difficult things that I've felt is that I don't have energy for things other than myself right now. And that's been uh, confronting and challenging because usually I have been, you know, for the last 10 years or more been thinking about, you know, the ways that I want to be in service and the projects and things like that. And it's, it's made me quite intercellular and I felt a little bit like I'm in a bit of survival mode. So I feel like I've just had the energy for, you know, my, my own self care and thinking about what that really looks like right now. So then hopefully I can kind of um, build myself up enough to then reach out once again and, you know, be in service, but we, we can't, we can't do it if we have no energy ourselves. And so that's one of the, the largest things I think that I'm learning right now is how important that self-care is and what that actually looks like for me. So for the time being, your people care is engaging in deep self-care and so that you can emerge on the other side, ready to go. Yep. Yeah. And, and trying to accept that as well. Like I've still obviously got I have all of my mind maps and I was, you know, doing a mind map last night about like courses and projects and I'm doing online things. I've just been, I'm running two courses online called the Herbal Apprentice and I've got my Patreon. So I'm still like making um, herbal medicines to send out to people and doing blog posts and, you know, things like that. But it is, it's a lot less than I'm actually used to doing. And obviously right now, because we can't kind of connect with people and communities and things like that, it just, it seems very intercellular and yeah. So, and I'm also learning how to, yeah, navigate when I feel really tired or really unable to kind of give to my community and yeah, it's just been a a real journey and I'm, I'm hoping that I can kind of accept that and, and practice that really fully so then I can emerge I've been feeling, I've been uh, using the term, I feel like butterfly mush at the moment. I feel like I'm butterfly mush and I'm like kind of in this cocoon and hopefully I'll be able to kind of like reemerge and transform into something else in, yeah, a few months when the lockdown is over. And I think about when my daughter was young, she had a, a great love of butterflies. And so we studied that for a while and how during that metamorphosis, that the butterfly in the cocoon, it just, it's unidentifiable as what it will be when it emerges on the other side. And the way that these trying and difficult periods can be ones of transformation for ourselves, that we can take the time to engage in deep self-care so that we can have a dissolution of self and really reimagine where we are in our lives and who we want to be and then emerge radically transformed on the other side of it. Yeah, radical transformation. Like, you know, I think that radical transformation, it starts with the way that we think a lot. And I think that that's what I'm trying to uh, focus on a little bit because one of the things that, you know, people talk to me all the time about permaculture and they're like, oh, but I, you know, I kill everything. I'm not, I don't have a green thumb or it. But, you know, I, I always say it's not about that. Like permaculture is not necessarily just about gardening. I feel like it's been marketed towards gardening. There's like, there's so much more to it than that. And one of the things is it's about the way that you think. It's, it changes the way you think. And if you look at the early um, systems theorists, like if uh, um, I've been reading a little bit about Gregory Bateson, who's amazing, and he's got an incredible book called um, Steps to an Ecology of Mind. And he's all about changing our minds so that we think like an ecological system instead of always thinking like 
A plus B equals C because that's not like an ecology. And so I really believe that a lot of radical transformation starts with the radical transformation of the mind itself. And from there, that's where the work can happen. And that's one of the things that I love, fell in love with about permaculture from the very beginning was how it changed my brain. I was recently exchanging some emails with a permaculture colleague in Australia. And in that, we were talking about how in permaculture education, something I'm working on with Karin Olson is the idea of the permaculture pit. And that when you go through a permaculture design course, because of the way Western education has emerged, when you're done, you want to do something, but you have all this information and aren't necessarily sure about your next steps. And one of the things my Australian colleague had shared was that a lot of times we wind up becoming focused on outcomes rather than process. And that's where I think that being able to shift our thoughts away from having to write the perfect paper or create the greatest design, that if we move away from outcomes and back to a focus on process, it would radically change our education experience within permaculture because all of the ways we can look at the different designs that could emerge in that liminal space of unstructured yet organized thoughts and that it's not about the outcomes that you can post to Instagram, but the process that takes you through that journey. Yeah. I feel like permaculture courses can actually sometimes perpetuate that a little bit because, you know, at the end you have, you have a design, like, you know, it's a, and it's a lot of focus on, on, on the design, the design that you present. Whereas instead of making the design a process, the design is like a constant process of feedback between you and the landscape and the people within that landscape and the inhabitants within that landscape. Like I feel like permaculture can be actually made quite human centric a lot of the time. And I've noticed that in, in permaculture design courses, a lot of people will become very fixated on this design. And it's already, it, it's quite funny as well, because it's like, we're trying to think of like outside the box thinking, but in a permaculture design course, you're still taught to think inside a box because you think inside the property that you're designing. And that is, then perpetuates this human centric view because you're looking at just the property. So you're looking at ownership. You're looking at the, the, the thing that you own or the thing that you have control over. And sometimes the ecosystem outside of that, the human ecosystem, you know, the flora and the fauna outside of that box get forgotten about. And that's where the ecological kind of thinking comes in mind and needs to kind of be brought in because otherwise we'll kind of still keep, um, keep focusing on the design as a fixed product rather than a process that we're in, not with ecology, but as part of ecology. That our design as a process is very iterative, and though we may have certain human needs we want to meet in this process, that the design is never really complete. Our design is a place to start from, or perhaps as a middle goal, but as educators and designers, how can we continue to stay in touch with our students and our clients to continue that evolution of education and design and these other pieces in the process? Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a, it is quite a metaphor for, like, the way that we live, you know. It, it all is it's a process. Like, we're not a... We get taught, I think, from a young age to t treat ourselves like products to present ourselves in a certain way. We are something that we're working on to make perfect, you know, for, and we need to get there and we need to, to do this thing. And, oh, I'm nearly there. Or, I nearly did it. And it's like, well, is it ever really done? We're like, we're, we're constantly evolving being. I don't remember where this quote comes from, but it's something along the lines of human beings are works in progress that think they're complete that this moment we're in is the person who we are, who we were, who we always will be, but we're, we're always changing. The person we are today wasn't the person who went to bed last night and isn't going to be the person who wakes up tomorrow. As we continue to change and learn more and move, then shouldn't our design, and shouldn't all of these processes that we're engaged in as permaculture practitioners move towards something that is more, well... As we mentioned when we first talked, it was about transition, but it sounds like what's emerging in our conversation today is an acknowledgement of the fluid nature of what we're going through and 
how things continue to move and being open to continual dynamic change. Yes. Yeah. And being able to adapt to that. Like um, I've been obviously thinking in in times of this uh, crisis in the world right now, I've been thinking a lot about adaptability and, and what that means and how we can use permaculture to adapt to situations, not only permaculture, but a, you know, a bunch of different things. How do we use it to adapt to such critical change in the world? Because I feel like that's where true resilience comes from, is that adaptability. And in a moment of crisis, like what you mentioned earlier about being able to look forward for generations, when we're caught in a crisis, it can be hard to look beyond the moment that we're in. Or we may find ourselves falling into habits that are there to just get us through the day, but that can make it hard to plan, which can make it hard to make meaningful decisions for ourselves or the people we care about and the world around us. Very much so. And I've, I've witnessed that. Like, I've witnessed that in Melbourne right now. Like, a, a lot of people have reverted back to, uh, like, you know, old habits or, like, you know, ways of, uh, of being or, you know, uh, certain addictions they might have or certain things like that. Because people at the moment don't have the faculties to build new neural pathways to put the energy into actually building something different and new habits for themselves because a lot of the energy is like uh, feels like survival lots of people are in like are quite anxious about what's going on and so I guess that yeah for me with my herbalism experience as well because I am uh, training to be a herbalist and a clinician and that's what a lot of my work is now I'm thinking about deep nourishment right now. And I'm, I'm thinking about how do we nourish our, ourselves by ourselves and how do we nourish our communities so that we can actually become more adaptable and more resilient because I'm realizing that a lot of people are running on empty right now. And from the work and practices you've been engaging in, do you have thoughts for folks on how they can build their personal and community resilience? Yeah, I, I look, I think a lot about nourishment. I think that it is different for obviously the, from a personal level, it's different for, for each person. One of the things that I'm learning a lot about is respecting your own pace and not trying to be where someone else is or like someone else. Or I think that, you know, um, I remember li- listening to a interview that you did actually with, um, is it Ethan Hughes? I think it was like a two hour interview. And one of the things that he said was he talked about like basically comparison. He didn't say it like this. I don't think that he said like, you know, basically comparison being the root of all evil kind of thing. That's a line of his that I've referred to often that comparison is the death of joy. Yes. Yes. And I was just like, oh, that's wonderful because, you know, I catch myself doing it all the time. And I think that a deep nourishment comes from respecting yourself and and that means respecting where you're at and what you're doing and that for me I think will build a personal resilience quite a lot and as far as communities go right now and nourishing communities it's a little bit hard right now because Melbourne hasn't had the blessing of community for the privilege of community for six months or so now properly which for me, it has been really eye-opening because what I've seen in, in history is usually in times of crisis, community is what gets people through. Dancing, singing, being with people, you know, finding those moments of laughter throughout a really difficult situation. They're the, they're the human moments that make getting through it possible, I feel. And right now it's very strange to not have access to that. But I think that right now it's teaching people how important that really is. And I'm quite excited to see, I'm hoping that when people come out of this, it's going to be reframing how we interact with each other and our communities and seeing the simple joy in interaction and what what we took for granted a lot. I think that there is just a deep nourishment in relating and the art of relating. And that's why I am so passionate about permaculture because I realize that I'm not necessarily passionate about permaculture. I'm passionate about relationship. I'm passionate about ecological thinking. I'm passionate about the way that things interact with each other. 
I think that's absolutely mesmerizing. And I think that a deep community nourishment and resilience comes from the way that we interact with each other and the intentions that we keep in mind when we're interacting. It doesn't sound very practical in some ways, but it's, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot and bringing it back to a level of what is like, yeah, what is my intention within this relationship, within this community, you know, and how do I choose to relate to these people? Because I think that it's un, not spoken about too much. And I think that the ripple effects of that are actually incredibly significant and make huge changes on a practical level to the outcome of different projects. There's this book that has nothing really to do with permaculture, but there's an American security expert, Gavin DeBecker, who wrote a book, The Gift of Fear. And it was in that book that he expresses this fact that no is a complete sentence. And it was through reading that book and some of the things related to it, that even though his writing is about like personal security, it also has a lot to do with what we consider the places where we're comfortable, how we create boundaries. And it was a book that really required me as I read it to examine where I was in life and consider the different relationships I was involved in and those that may have drifted that I wanted to reinforce, as well as those that were no longer really functional or serving myself or the other people who were in it. And then taking those lessons and kind of stepping back and using that declaration of boundaries and being able to say no to strengthen and deepen the relationships that mattered. And it turned into another one of those cases of radical self-care. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, it's, it can be overlooked quite often. And I remember there was a podcast uh, that I was listening to and I'm, forgive me because I can't actually remember the names, but I, the statistics stuck out to me a lot, which was, um, there was a man that had done some research in permaculture communities in the U S and he was talking about how something like 90% of them failed in the first four years due, due to lack of social cohesion. And that really stood out to me because, you know, here we are, we want to do all of these practical things. And I feel like we really need to do a lot of practical work within the permaculture community. I think it's getting to a point now where it's not necessarily just about growing a lettuce in your backyard. It's like, okay, how do we actually create resilient systems, not only food systems, but social systems, political systems, economic systems? How do we create these for a resilient future? Because right now I feel like it's becoming more of a necessity rather than just kind of a, a hobby. But the way that we actually interact together makes a huge difference to the success of those projects and practices. And through my work and being involved in various different communities, farms, and different situations, I've become increasingly interested in that because, you know, I say to a lot of people, you know, give me a landscape any day. I can design a landscape, you know, but people, <laughs> people, are, people are hard. <laughs> they're, they're more difficult. Um, so for me anyway, so I've become uh, increasingly more interested in that form of relating the way that, that we think and the way that the re we relate and how they can actually create a solid foundation on our, for our projects to be formulated upon. One of my permaculture instructors always said that we should try to design out the designer. But in saying so, it wasn't about making a system that could stand on its own but rather about creating something that could easily be communicated to someone else so that they could maintain the system if we weren't available to. And it goes back to that idea of thinking long-term. If someone is working with us to create a permaculture design, how can we work with them to create something that, if they move on from that project for whatever reason, it can still exist and doesn't just get plowed up or cut down? Is it about community education? Or do we have to put up signs to explain what's there? Like, what are the different ways we can engage with the information that exists in a design once it becomes a functioning garden or other space? Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, yeah, really considering the longevity of that. And, you know, designing out the designer, I, you know, I think that's kind of like wonderful. You know, that's a, and that's a really anti-capitalist thing. Like usually like, well, yeah, within capitalism, they, they want to uh, keep you at a certain point of wanting more. It's like, 
addiction in a way. It's like I heard a quote the other day that said, um, well, you could, you'll always be addicted to something that almost works because it keeps you wanting more. And I feel like that's what happens with, with capitalism quite a lot. But a lot, and a lot of people wouldn't want to be designed out because, you know, then they're like, oh, if I, if I have a permaculture design business, for example, like why would I want to be designed out? But, but that's not thinking about the, the broader goal and the broader context, that, which is the ecological systems that we're trying to actually conserve. And that's the end goal. So designing out the designer is great because that means that that system is then functioning once more. And I'm, I'm reading a book at the moment, actually, um, which is incredibly interesting. It's called Sand Talk. And uh, its subtitle is How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. And it's actually blowing my mind a lot. And I'm trying to find the differences and similarities between Indigenous thinking and permaculture within it. because I am constantly awed by Indigenous cultures and their functioning as part of an ecology because they're not just a designer overseeing something. they part of that system. And it's a beautiful thing when I'm teaching because I get to speak to people about this because a lot of people I've, I've taught actually have this view that the world is better without humans. And I always bring it back to Indigenous thinking and Indigenous practices because the ecology functions with those people there. It's like, you know, it's like a wallaby eating some grass and the grass needs to reshoot. It's like picking, you know, your, the tip of your sage plant and then it, like, it, it's sprouting at the sides. And it's like we can actually interact with our environments in a way that benefits that environment. But I just don't think that very many people have seen examples of that. So I really like to kind of bring it back to that for people and say, no, like we can function. We are part of ecology. We've just got to remember our place within it. That was a bit of a tangent, but (laughs) I got excited. (laughs) We were able to release two episodes close together because we had spent so much time talking last time and it went so quickly and it's happened to us again today. I love everything you've shared with me and being able to have just this open conversation about where life has gone for you and the way that that relates to your thinking on permaculture. But in the few minutes we have remaining, do you have anything else you'd like to add to this conversation? Yeah, if I'm going to be speaking to the listeners out there that are quite inspired about permaculture or they're looking to create you know, change within their own lives or change within the broader system, I think that one of the things that I am learning a lot about at the moment is I have been reading a lot about Indigenous practices within Australia and the decolonization of permaculture. And I think that one of the most beneficial things that we could do at this stage is to acknowledge Indigenous thinking and Indigenous knowledge and not that we can necessarily go back, but I think that it can it could teach us a lot because I think that permaculture has kind of been taken and strategized. There's you know there's a lot of strategies and practical aspects that have been taken from different cultures around the world to formulate permaculture. However, I feel like the story, the myth, the spirituality, the the you know in Australia, the dreaming, all of these things have actually been left out. And I think that there is a huge part that these things play in the way that we relate to our landscapes. And I think that if we don't find a way to relate and connect to our landscapes on a kind of personal and lack of a better term, even spiritual level, I feel like we're going to be missing the point for quite a long time because we're going to be approaching it from a very patriarchal kind of viewpoint. And I would like to kind of offer that way of thinking to people or that, that exploration to people to start exploring permaculture in a bit of a different way that really connects us to our landscape, not just practically. Well, thank you for that, Taj for everything else you shared, and for joining me on this, the 10th anniversary episode of the Permaculture Podcast. 
You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. It's been a pleasure. And that was Tasha Kluna. You can find her work at thepermapixie.com, which includes links to her Patreon and presence around the web. To celebrate this 10th anniversary, I have a few giveaways on offer, thanks to our friends at Homegrown Design and Permaculture Principles. From David and his crew, those are copies of the book 470 by Linda Woodrow, a fictional account of what the world could look like and how we'll adapt as carbon in the atmosphere continues to climb and climate change transforms the world we live in. From Permaculture Principles is the 2021 Permaculture Calendar, which includes a picture each month that demonstrates a different permaculture principle and also includes the ideal leaf, root, and fruit days and the lunar cycles so you can track and plan your year. Though you're more than welcome to enter for a calendar, I only have a few of those to give away, so you can also pick up more, for yourself or as a gift, at permacultureprinciples.com. Copies are only $11.95, and all profits are donated to the Perma Fund, which makes microgrants available around the world. Enter either or both of those giveaways by emailing show at thepermaculturepodcast.com with the subject 10th anniversary giveaway and indicate which item, or both, you're entering for. This interview, this season, and the fact that this marks 10 years since I graduated from my permaculture design course and started the show leaves me in a bit of a reflective place. I think about what Taj said about passion and all the things I love about hosting this show and sharing all of these personal stories with you. With a decade and hundreds of episodes behind us, I'll continue this work for as long as I can, knowing that it will ebb, flow, and change over time. Some of that includes, starting next spring, expanding to visual storytelling with filmed interviews and site tours. Though I'll keep producing the long-form interviews that became what this show was known for, I'm looking to partner with other people who have interviews they want to record and share. I'd also like to teach you what I do, so that more people get involved in recording their own interviews and sharing them with the world. These conversations reflect a form of community storytelling that connect us to other people around the world, and I think, make the world a smaller, more closely connected place as we create virtual villages of like-minded people. So if you're interested in becoming a contributor to the Permaculture Podcast, have a question you'd like answered in an upcoming episode, someone to suggest for an interview, or to become a student of podcast storytelling, get in touch. Show at thepermaculturepodcast.com. As this 10th anniversary episode draws to a close, whether this is your first time listening or you've been with me from day one, thank you for being part of the journey so far and for walking alongside me as we see what the future has to offer. Until the next time, spend each day exploring your passion and sharing your unique story while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other.